This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Visit JabberjawMedia.com for more shows like this one. This week, we hosted a roundtable about music licensing. How does it work? And what are the options for bands and artists? Welcome to the future of what? I'm your host, Portia Saban, president of the independent record label, Kill Rockstars. Support for the future of what comes from Merch Table. Are you a band who's struggling to run an online store? Let's face it, your bass player is a terrible mail carrier, and you really can't practice when the singer is trying to track down a lost package. A merch table can help, with services ranging from warehousing and shipping, to customer service, screen printing, tour logistics, and even marketing. You focus on your art, and Merch Table will handle the rest. MerchTable.com We spoke to Kat Olson from Marmoset and Richie Young from Loch Lomond about what licensing is all about. And it's all coming up on the future of what. Can I have a taste of your ice cream? Can I lick the crumbs from your table? Can I interfere in your crisis? No, mind your own business. The future of what is supported by Sound Exchange. So we have a special roundtable today in partnership with Vortex Music Magazine. We have Kat Olson, the senior music supervisor at Marmoset, and we have Richie Young of the band Lock Lamond here to talk with us about music supervising, mu- music licensing, and all things related to licensing your music for various types of things. So Richie and Kat, welcome to the future of what? Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hi. Okay, so Kat, I thought maybe you could get us started by, just for anyone who's not familiar, I mean, most people listening to this podcast will be familiar, but just what is music licensing? What are are we talking about here? Sure. That's a difficult question to answer quickly. (laughs) (laughs) There's no Um, rush. (laughs) We got an hour. Yeah, so I, I guess my own personal, the way that I do it is clients, typically ad agency clients or advertising clients, Sometimes TV, sometimes film, come to me, ask me for a specific type of music. I look through the roster of artists that I work for for something that matches. I pitch music to them. Hopefully they like it, and they would eventually license it and pay out the band to use the track in whatever medium they were putting their spot on. That was very concise. Oh, that was thank not, you. <laughs> <laughs> that was not uh, long-winded at all. Oh, thank you. So now music licensing, just so we're all on the same page, you know, when I got into the business 20 some years ago, getting a license for a song was a very lucrative proposition. And that was largely because brands, let's say, were looking to license famous music to, you know, enhance their credibility, et cetera. Things started to change a little bit in the licensing industry because they started using different music. So it went from being, we want to license you know, I was about to say the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, which are not actually really that licensed, but you know what I mean? Like something very famous. And, you know, I always pinpoint that Volkswagen ad that used the Nick Drake song as like, that was the moment that things changed in licensing. And people got real excited about this notion of independent artists, bands that instead of, you know, associating you with a millionaire rock star or a huge song that you're instead getting associated with a scene and a vibe and a coolness, right? So interestingly, around the same time, maybe a little bit later, and you, you can probably speak to this, Richie, I feel like, you know, when I got into the this label, Kill Rock Stars, we had bands on, on this label like Bikini Kill, bands that were not going to license their music to any kind of advertising, right? Because that would be selling out. Definitely. Right? <laughs> Definitely. Exactly. That was a big thing. But weirdly, that also sort of started to shift in this funny way. So nowadays, you know, I have bands coming to me saying, we really think our music is licensable. Like they want their music to be licensed Mm -hmm. desperately because people have realized that it can be so lucrative. Anyway, I'm just going on and on. I have a whole (laughs) list of things I could talk about. But Richie, let's get you involved. So you have been in this band, Loch Lomond, for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Quite some time. You started the band in 2003 or four. Yeah. I was scared to say that because I thought it couldn't possibly be that long (laughs) ago. (laughs) That's a, that's, I was old then. That's a a long lived indie band. Yeah. 
Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been, I mean, you've gone through several iterations, but it's been pretty much your project, correct? It's a, yeah, essentially it's my project. And we, and we have a bunch of friends that kind of rotate in and out. Out, as in they've, they've joined really big bands or in that they're on little breaks, but I'm definitely the smallest they work with. But it's 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 been a ton of fun, and I've had like 75 people Wow! over the years, so coming yeah. in and out. So I work with the band Horse Feathers, and oh, yeah. I feel like Justin is in the same boat. He's always Justin like... Justin was in the band, too. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And vice versa, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you guys have overlapped a lot of players yeah. in the last several years. And many of the same players, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the I've actually pitched your band, too. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So lots of overlap. <laughs> so tell me some of your experiences with licensing over the over the years. I, I would agree. When I first moved to Portland in 1997, it was like detrimental for a band to license their music out. Basically, they were just saying goodbye and I'm going to law school and we just sold our music to Levi's or something like that. I moved to the East Coast for years and when I came back, it was different. It was kind of, now it's the lifeblood. Like we hope for that to, mm -hmm. to keep going so we can hit the road and record and whatever but yeah, it started to change like the Nick Drake Volkswagen commercial. I think now we would want to associate our music with like bicycle helmets made in Southeast Portland. You know, like it's a good partnership and it keeps us going. And it also adds to the credibility of a new business or an older business. But yeah, it's completely changed. It was very negative at the beginning. Now it's very positive. You have to have it. So I've had smaller and, and medium-sized stuff for, for the band, but anything from Montana Board of Transportation or, you know, something like that all the way up to, like, like a Box Trolls. So, yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things that you're mostly happy when you open up your email in the morning if you get a notification that something might happen. It's positive, so. Box Trolls, the movie? Yeah, we did. Uh, we contributed four songs and that was a huge education to work on that level. So, oh, I'll bet yeah. that is a great movie. I by love the that way. movie. I that, love my that kid guy. loves that movie. <laughs> yeah, very cool. So, I was doing a panel a couple weekends ago, and we had a music supervisor on there. She's not personally, but she works, she has a music supervision company, licensing company. And she said something really interesting. She said that it's kind of like what happened in the industry to drive down prices is kind of our fault, which is interesting. I liked that. I was like, wow, you're right. No one has ever said that to me, but it's totally true because basically what happened was when they started negotiating, when they started realizing that indie music was cool, bands were like, we'll do it for cheaper than, you know, 200 grand or 100 grand or whatever it was that the going price was before. So we saw a very steep decline. When I took over Kill Rockstars in 2006, we were still seeing some pretty big prices for licenses. But then they just, it like fell off a cliff and we were suddenly like, they want to, they're offering us $500. I actually got something from a guy the other day. He said, I'm going to, you know, tell me where to send the $1 check. <laughs> and I was like, that's just embarrassing. Can you like give it to somebody on the street or something <laughs> like that? Don't send us a dollar. Like, that's so sad. But like, what do you think about that? I somewhat agree. I mean, there's this weird scope of music licensing where you have the higher end stuff like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin that you're talking about. And then there's the studio music, which is you know, people expect to pay a dollar for that to get unlimited rights. I also think it has something to do with the industry. You used to make a spot and it would run for a year and you would spend $50,000 upwards on a song. Now they're making spots that go on Instagram, social media, you know, they're running them weekly instead of yearly and they don't have the budgets like they used to anymore and we're seeing that we still try to fight for an equal payout to the artists because a lot of our artists this is now their lifeblood like you said they're not making money from the record industry anymore it's based on this one license is going to pay for their album but it's it's hard the budgets are falling and I think it's partially due to expectation but also it's just the industry as a whole all the budgets are falling that's just an ad industry but Right, definitely. The movie industry still seems to be fairly oh, yeah. healthy. That one's still doing well. You can yeah. still get a lot of money if you're in the right movie industry. Yeah. But you got to break in for that, too. You got to be with the right licensing people who are pitching to movies. Oh, so. tell us more about that. <laughs> well, like the dollar example that you had, a lot of the higher channels will just pay a dollar because they have to legally pay you something. Right. But they're doing it more on exposure and they can get a lot of indie artists to say, yeah, you can totally use my song. I'm just so excited to be on MTV or whatever the show may be. But then there's also, if you can get in with the right people where it's perceived that your music has more value, they will pay you more. And it's this weird, 
uh, you have to break in and be part of the popular kids to be able to be on that tier. That's not the pay you because it's legal, pay you because it's worth something. Right. That's interesting. So different licensing companies, like you work with Marmoset. I do have different specialties then. Yeah. So we're more of a boutique agency. We tend to work with DIY artists that aren't, most of them are not licensed yet or they're not signed to a label. They tend to do their own thing from, you know, their their garage, they're recording their own stuff. So we can pitch them at a lower tier because they're just excited to get any license and they want to get their music out. They're starting out. But then there's other licensing agencies that work with, like we work in partner with a place called Fervor Records and they license all vintage catalog and music. And all of their artists, because they had some top 40 playtime, are perceived at a higher value. But yeah, there's, there's a whole scope of different licensing agencies. I mean, you have like the Capitol Records, Kill Rock Stars, you know, there's, it varies. Right. How, can I ask a question? How yeah. did you fall, how did you find yourself working in this business? I actually started how you did. I was an artist on the Marmoset roster. Oh. <laughs> and I was a producer using Marmoset on my projects. And then I got hired by Marmoset. Right. <laughs> Good company. Yeah, it's a great company. It's one of the few music licensing places I've encountered that truly advocate for artists, just because we understand that every license they land means they can record another album or maybe go on tour. That's our end game. <laughs> Definitely. So, Richie, when you did the stuff for the film, were those songs that you'd already written that were on an album, or did you have to create those specially for the, for the movie? We learned a lot working with Leica, because in, in the past, you know, they're like, someone likes the song or it's a match. And then they're like, do you have an instrumental version? And then they bring in the vocals and drop the vocals, depending, or none. But it is what it is. And, you know, occasionally we've re-recorded a song because we've lost the file without vocals. And that's, it's still fun. But we learned a lot uh, working with Leica because they wanted things to be exactly the, and to fit into their format. And it was very, very different. So, like, we would record and re-record and record and re-record and then cut stuff up and... We applied that to our latest record, purposely like throwing wrenches into the project to change it up. So I, I tend to write very like, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It's really simple. And working with them, it was much more complicated and made me a better musician and a, and a writer because of their extremely challenging rules <laughs> that they would throw at us, which was fun, tons of fun. But yeah, I definitely, we learned a lot. And that's a different, I mean, that's a different kind of composition. That's like a work made for hire, right? Yeah, yeah. Rather than a song that you've written. And I feel like those, those are important distinctions for people to understand because someone can be a songwriter like you are, write songs for your band, put them out on an album. And having one of those songs licensed is actually completely different from writing a song specifically, like being hired to write a composition because they're the, it's just legally they're different. The money is different. You know, yeah. a recorded piece of music, like let's say it was on my label. I mean, let's say for in your case, it's on Tender Loving Empire, right? So there's a master side and a publishing side. Yeah. So you'll get paid for the publishing side, but TLE will get paid for the master side yeah. and then pass that on to you. Mm -hmm. But if it's a work made for hire composition, they're actually hiring you to do a job. Yes. Yeah. Right. Which was di very different. And, and it was fun, but very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of artists are doing that. I mean, I know we work with Terror Bird in, which is now, I was going to say in LA, but gee, they're in LA, they're in New York. God, San Francisco. They're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> is George Just, still running that place? Yep. Or, in yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. I like that guy. Totally. So, but we work with them and several of our artists also are on the side or doing compositions for hire. Like they, they will write for an ad or they'll mm -hmm. write a jingle or they'll write for a movie or something. Yeah, we actually pull a lot of our, we do original composition at Marmoset too, and we pull a lot of our talent pool for composing out of our artist pool, because if someone shows promise, if there's a whole difference between being able to write an album and being able to write for picture, it's a whole different set of skills. But if they show promise there, a lot of times we'll foster them to be an actual composer. And who at your company is in charge of noticing that in an artist? Yeah, so <laughs> we have two separate departments that do that. We have an a and R department, our artist relations, and then we have an original music department. And the producers from original music are best at identifying the artists that work for that, but our artist relations department are the ones that bring them to us first. Like, this person is just cranking out tons of albums. They seem like they'd be really good at working for, you know, under specific direction as opposed to under their own free will. And then hopefully we can collaborate with them to write music to picture. That's interesting. So as an artist, it seems like getting connected with Marmoset would be very advantageous to them in a lot of ways or could be it if, could be if yeah, they turn absolutely. out to be like a very 
prolific or directable or whatever songwriter, you know, someone who's got talent in that in that area. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your advice to young bands on how to get connected with Marmoset? So my first piece of, I guess not advice, but forewarning is some of the best artists that I know do not work well for licensing. It's just music is so subjective with ads. They want, you know, an ascending arc, that kind of thing that a lot of really awesome indie bands, even though we love their music, they might not work well for licensing. So never take it to heart if someone doesn't want your license for your song for their Levi's campaign. But as far as getting involved, for Marmoset, there's a bunch of emails that you can reach out to, and I can get you those. But just getting involved in our community is probably one of the best ways to do it. We are always hosting events where artists can come in and meet with our filmmakers that we work with. You can meet with the producers that make the music at Marmoset, music supervisors like myself. And that's a good way to at least put a face to the name. We really like to be personable with our artists so that it's not just some band that we're licensing. It's people we actually know. And when our clients ask us why this band over this, you know, 99 cent stock track, we can say, oh, because band member by name is awesome and really talk about them and understand why the music is important because this is real music. Right. Well, and that's how it is across the whole industry. It's oh, all yeah. about who you know and not just who you know, but it's about personal connections and relationships, you yeah. know, and it's it's always better to work with people that you like. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> And, and people like, tend to work with people that they like. Oh, yeah. And I feel like in ads, too, especially with music, a lot of creatives just see it as like, it's a stock track. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And for us, it's, no, it's, this is real. These are real artist songs. This is not stock music. Somebody created this because they felt it. It's not something they just created in their apartment at 3 a.m. quickly. They put months into this album and into the song. And if you want it for your brand, you should understand that and think that that's important. So that's I think that's been more widely accepted lately. I agree. I think yeah. people are sort of getting that. I think the they're not as interested in like the soulless, you know. I hope so. Although you do I still just hear made it. this with a computer <laughs> in five minutes. Yeah, exactly. Kind of uh, kind of like the example you gave, I say it's like the Feist phenomenon where people loved one, two, three by Feist because of that iPod spot. Mm -hmm. And after that brands wanted to be able to launch an artist, not just use their song. They wanted that as part of their brand. Like, we're the brand that launched this artist and made them famous. And yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand with that. It has Absolutely. soul and they believe in it. Absolutely.
was Say My Name by Summer Cannibals. If you're enjoying this program, please subscribe to our show on iTunes and leave us a review. To find out what's coming up next, follow us on Twitter at KRSFOW. You're listening to The Future of What? We're talking to Kat Olson and Richie Young. So Richie, I'm assuming you've worked with several different licensing places. You know, more than one place has placed your music over over time. Yeah, I, it's, I was just thinking about when you guys were talking about James Mercer selling that song to McDonald's and how shocked I was that everyone was cool with it. Um, right. Which is, I'm not judging him or the, the the corporation, but it's it was that shift where where it was like, oh, that's cool, that's good. He got some money, he gets to pay his band members, you know. I, like, I, yeah, I always remember that Outback yeah. Steakhouse ad by of Montreal, the song. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and I'm like, because that was the moment that I was like, what? Like, where are we? Who, yeah. What has happened yeah. in life? Everything flipped. Everything, which flipped. is a good thing. Like. We would not have a small, but we do have a career over in Europe because of a bicycle dude. Got an email years ago that they wanted to use our song, and we're like, sure. And I think people still watch it, and it has like 55 million hits on YouTube. And people still come to our shows over there and reference that as like, we love your music because we listened to that song, and we bought your records, and we were coming to the show. because, And we would have had none of that without someone emailing us, can we put your music in a bicycle thing? So it does. It definitely helps. I can't really think of anything negative. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the negative thing is the the poor f- uh, physical sales and the, the decreasing digital sales. But in a, in a weird way, you kind of make that up with doing licensing stuff. If it works right and it's a good match, then people will come to your shows and then you'll be able to continue on. So it's 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 definitely changed. I'm just changed since you've started, and me, all of us that are a little bit been in this for a while. Older, is that yeah. what you're trying to say <laughs> in a nice way? Yes, old, old is old as dirt. That's us. <laughs> yes, but it's changed, and I'm glad that it's it's we're able to continue because it's changed in this way. Yeah, and I would say the most important thing for anyone listening about licensing is that licensing always involves the artist's consent. You guys get a choice. That's the thing. If, you know, someone emails you from Europe and says, we want to use your music in a bicycle ad or whatever it was, you got a chance to say yes to that. Oh, yeah. Or no. Yeah. And that's the part that is really important because, you know, I think there are other areas in the music business where consent is not happening, where artists are not being allowed to choose. And I think that's the the problem that we're having in the music business today. So licensing has always been wonderful for that. So it's like, we're very grateful that we have the opportunity at this point to say yes, if you want to, or to say no. You know, I mean, the thermals famously turning down that Hummer ad for $45,000 or whatever it was years ago. Good for them. They, and it helped that them. That was fine. And it helped them. And exactly. it was a wise move. It and, was a good move. And it, people talked about that. Like there is the negative and you can say no. And that's, yeah, that's right. great. But consent is the most important aspect of that, I think. The example that is closest to my life about where a license really changed an artist's entire trajectory was when I was managing the band The Gossip. Mm -hmm. And we said yes to a license for a new TV show called Skins in the UK. And that show blew up, Mm -hmm. but it blew up with kids who were downloading the song on the internet. And so it was very sort of underground but then the crazy part, so we that started in like February of 2007. And in March 2007, they changed the way the charts were calculated in the UK. So they counted downloads and they were, Gossip was number seven on the charts, oh, wow. on the radio charts, where they had been not at all. Yeah. Right. And we had been going to England and going to England and playing radio stations and just, and we even had the song played a few times on the radio, but it just didn't catch like they weren't. And then it was number seven on the charts, and it was like, boom, then they went gold in the UK. Yeah. So it can make an entire difference oh, yeah. to your life oh, yeah. <laughs> in a very big way. I mean, you know, I think most smaller artists hope for that, like hope for that thing to just kind of match up perfectly and then take off. Like it does help considerably. So Yeah, and it can make, I'm sure it can make a difference for an artist like you in your whole year's budget. You know, I mean, I remember when Horse Feathers got a license for the California Dairy Board which is, you know, on the surface, that doesn't sound very exciting. But they did nine commercials, nine TV commercials and maybe internet spots. Maybe they were only internet spots. I can't remember. This is years ago. And they licensed like 12 or 13 Horse Feather songs. And then they picked it up 
for another year and then they picked it yep. up for another yeah. year. I mean, that was just like free money. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. You can make so much money off royalties and renewals yes. with that kind of thing. And it was incredible. Yeah, just perpetual in a certain sense. It's great. Yeah. So a lottery. It is. Yeah. It's like lottery. <laughs> but that's what I always tell young bands. I always say, listen, licensing is great, but it's like getting hit by lightning. Mm -hmm. It is not. You cannot plan your year's budget on it. You can't plan a tour on it. <laughs> you can't. You know, you just have to be grateful for it if it happens. For sure. Even on our end, like, I will pitch a song that I'm like, this is the exact match for what you want. This band is totally going to get it. And then some director somewhere is like, nah, I don't like it because it's so subjective. No. It just all has to line up perfectly. And exactly. to be in the right mood and the right day and pick it. And right. then, yeah, that band benefits if they pick it. And, you know, it's funny because I wish, I, I feel the same way. Like, I often wish, like, we could just make it automatic, right? right. I mean, we had this band called Gospel Music that had this song called Automobile. It was like, automobile, take me away. Like, so cute. And I was like, how is that not in a car commercial? It is the perfect song for a car. Never got licensed. Yeah. Never got licensed. Yeah. But on the flip side of that is, I'm glad there are human beings picking these things. I'm, I am. I'm glad it's not like a computer program or something. Yeah, like, absolutely. I'm glad it's actually human beings. Even if they're wrong, I'm still happy that, you know, there are creatives on their side too. Yeah, definitely. Has a human element to it in the end. There's a human element, <laughs> even if those humans... Even if they should pick our songs, yeah. <laughs> why aren't they picking our songs? So, how many songs and tracks and things have you guys licensed over the years? You don't have to give me an exact number, but just I, like a ballpark. Not a ton, but I can't remember. Maybe like thirty. Maybe that's a sizable like some number. Medium, some really small that I completely forgot about. It's like oh sure, just hand it to someone on the street because it doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, it's it. Sometimes it's just great and sometimes it's just kind of a desert it's just dizzying highs and desperate lows i remember we were working with the walker agency out of portland and one of our songs was like i think kind of up there for the super bowl for turbo tax or something like that and i was like i try not to get excited about anything but i was also kind of like making vacation plans Ooh. like and, and we didn't get it trouble and it, it's i it's an hour and then I'm fine. But but yeah, it's just you can't count on any of that stuff. It's no. like, yeah, just keep keep working and, and producing. And then I don't even really think about it much. And I'm, it's exciting when you when something matches up and you're like, oh, I respect that that company or that product or what they're trying to do. And it's fun when it matches up and you're like, oh, this, you know, YouTube or, or television or radio or Internet advertising. It's, it's fun. It's fun when you make money and you can do extra fun things you know like you know like moving forward <laughs> but as as a as an artist we just create not thinking of that we just we just move forward because we like what we're doing and and it's just kind of a nice little bonus but i can definitely see and i definitely know a lot of artists that are solely about that like completely work night and day tirelessly on making product uh, or content for just movies or commercials. Right. And it's fun to talk to them, but it's a different motivation. Like Exactly. And it's a different output if you think about it, because we were just talking, I mean, your experience with like is a good one because it's like, okay, it's not good enough that you just write something for hire, hand it to them and walk away. No, they want tweaks. They want it this way and then mm -hmm. this way and then this way. And that's, I mean, my mom was in advertising, so I totally, that sounds like every advertising project on the planet is like, oh, that's perfect. Now do this do it, <laughs> right. and fix it in this way. Oh, we thought, no, actually we liked it better the first way. Can you put it back? Yes. Yeah. 26 yeah. changes it always, later. Yeah, it always back goes to back beginning. to the original. Yep. Yeah, it always goes back <laughs> to the original. Exactly. So does your mom, what, what does your mom think of how things have changed? Like, Well, she got out of the business. She used to be in ah, the business yeah. years ago. Yeah. She's, my mom always has this great story. I remember she cast TV commercials for companies like Oil of Olay. And I remember this one time my mom had a five-day casting call where she literally saw, she came home, she was like, I have seen every beautiful woman in, America, in New York City. <laughs> like, it was models, right? They were casting models for an Oil of Olay commercial. She's like, "I there is not a beautiful woman left. I have seen every single one of them and they don't like any of them. Right, yeah. They are not right. None of them are right. And she's like, I give up. <laughs> like, yeah. There is nobody left. <laughs> you have seen them all. <laughs> so rough. So. I, I, when I first moved to Portland, I was like, I'm a terrible break dancer, but I was break dancing at a party and these two guys came up to me and they're like, like, we work with this company. Want you to come in? And I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, and then people came up to me that are older and smarter and wiser than me. Like those guys are from White and Kennedy and they had like, that's for real. And I was like, eh. And they kept on trying to, to contact me and I'm super glad I did. And I, 
all the people that were in the, the waiting room were like handsome and symmetrical and tall and good looking and I'm short and I'm the way I look. And um, <laughs> but they, they wanted, wanted you. They wanted me yeah. to like to break dance, which was great. And I, I got paid a, a ton of money at the time. It is completely subjective on the other side of the fence. Exactly. Like they wanted yeah. a weird looking guy instead of like a model, you know. So. But that served their purpose. But that's what, yeah. you know, something you said earlier made me think that actually we are, that's another change in the industry that has been kind of awesome for artists yeah. is that there are so many more smaller brands and more boutique operations popping up that really want to have a connection to this local scene and to local artists. So they're going to be willing, they're going to be more interested in people who are like actually real people like that yeah. or, you know, local musicians. I think that that's... I mean, I love the idea of a Portland bike helmet company. I'm sure <laughs> such a thing exists. And probably, yeah. They probably... I, I think it does. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. I think it's changed for the better. I mean, I don't. I mean, when did you? When do you guys think it started to change? Like where songs didn't have to be giant, or the the actor or actress didn't have to be perfect. Like it started to shift. Well, I think it's gone through phases. Like, certainly think the actor not being perfect. Have you guys watched a movie from the 1970s lately? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, apparently we were okay with people being normal looking in movies in the 70s and early 80s. And then something happened. And now they have to be perfect. And it can't kind of, It's be, like a pendulum. I right? Guess. Yeah. Right. Swings back. So hopefully it'll swing back soon so that we can so. get over this, like craziness that's going start on. Break I mean, again. We can start breaking again. I think it is. Like, we're doing all, you know, the Dove commercials where they're like, exemplifying oh, that's like, true. real beauty that's true. That's so I think true. as far as like femininity is concerned like it's definitely coming back there as it might just be a gimmick for now hopefully not right but we're seeing trends in advertising that suggest it's coming back yeah well that would be nice it'd be really nice yeah in the good way in a good way okay good <laughs> was dumped by wimps. Support for the future of what comes from Merch Table. Kill Rockstars has partnered with Merch Table for almost six years now, and they've come through for us in a lot of ways. Like when the comedian Kurt Brownoller wanted a face towel with his face on it, Merch Table found a way to make this, and it's been one of our most popular items in our mail order store. KRS loves Merch Table. 
You're listening to The Future of What. We're talking to Kat Olson and Richie Young. Richie, can you remember what your first <laughs> license was? No, I can't. Actually, I can't. I would have to... Yeah, I, I just don't remember. I think... I mean, it, it was definitely small stuff and nothing that, like, changed the course of the band at the beginning. Uh-huh. I think we were... And we still are. Like, there's so many amazing, talented, huge bands in Portland alone. And we were just, you know, we're just one of the the smaller bands that happens to live here. But I think only because of sync stuff or licensing, we've been able to advance. And I tend, to, I'm glad that we're having this conversation because I tend to forget about that. That's like, it's the, it is the new vehicle. But yeah, I probably just should take you out to lunch sometime and pick <laughs> sure. your brain. I, I can't remember the first time. I think it was just smaller stuff. I remember the the first bigger things, but yeah, like nothing, nothing mind blowing. Nothing like, I wish I had that again. You know. Yeah. So see, I rem- I feel like I remember things that helped my bands break even. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I signed this Canadian band called Boats, which that was right in the middle of the period where everybody was naming their bands things that were totally ungoogleable. <laughs> like you just couldn't find them on search engines and i'm sure that that was everybody was doing it, it was like a trend but it drove, drove me crazy because it's like you just can't search for boats right like yeah what that, do you you get a lot of boats that trend is back now with where everyone's replacing like an a with a triangle oh like, that's yes that's hard so too hard. thanks a lot people. <laughs> thanks a lot bands but boats i remember they are super weird if you've never heard them you should listen to them the main dude sings in a super high squeaky falsetto like he's a little kid and they play just like just out out of control, poppy, goofy songs with names like Advice on Bioluminescent Bears, stuff like that. And I, well, Terra Bird got them a license in a TV show that paid $25,000. And that paid for the entire album. Yeah, <laughs> just, they just recouped in one fell swoop. And I was so excited to write that email. Like, guess what, you guys? Yeah. This is amazing. Like, it's just... To go into the black is a good day. Right? So, yeah. And I was, that's all I want from licenses, man. I just want to, like, open my email and be like, that band has recouped and that band has recouped. Yeah. That would... Those, just, those are my best days uh, when I get to tell an artist something like that. Right? Because they expect to hear, like, oh, you made 500 bucks, which is still a ton of money. But when I get to say, like, you made $25,000 or yes. something like that, and they're just like, I, I can't even imagine what they must go through when they get that email, like... You've been trying to schedule your tour, and now you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> it's just paid for. Yeah, yeah nice. it is. That's, see, look at your job. What a fun job. You that, get to, like, Christmas. It's fun. I also get to say, I'm sorry, you didn't get picked, which yeah. is the sad that's true. part of my job. But That's true. Yeah, that's <laughs> but a good part. At least the good part outweighs <laughs> the, the bad part. For sure. Yeah, totally. The, you guys are non-exclusive, right? We are, yeah. Yeah, um, so that's awesome. That's great. Are most companies non-exclusive now? or It depends. We are non-exclusive except for click licensing. And we only do that because we don't want you to be up on, you know, one of the 99 cent license sites and then people are price shopping you against what we say. So again, trying to make the songs have more value. But a lot of small boutique agencies are exclusive. We choose not to be just because, I mean, if our artists get signed and move on to bigger, better things, that's better for everyone. Mm -hmm. But... So what is this onboarding thing? What does that mean? Sure. Well, just going through a process. So like what I just said, where we're non-exclusive except for click licensing, trying to get instrumentals, which is something that we ask of every band and most bands don't have them. So either they have to create them or hopefully their engineer has the session files sitting around that they can create them for them. Sometimes we also work with bands on cut downs because your eight minute electronic opera is amazing, but Pepsi or Coke will never license it. So we try to work with them on, you know, a 30 second cut down of the best part of their song if they can create it. What what do you do with a 30 second cut down? Cut yeah. down of a so song. So this is specifically for advertising, but a lot of ads tend to be 15 or 30 seconds and they want an ascending arc to go along with oh. the action. So most band songs are about two and a half ish minutes. And so we'll work with bands to take like the chorus of their song and make that into a specific 30 second track because that will license better than the full song because creatives when they're dropping them into edits a 30 second that matches their action right off the bat is better than a two and a half minute song where they've got to find where it matches oh yeah yeah making it easy yeah making it easy for everyone we also try to get bands to send us stems if they have it which is the open sessions of the individual instruments and that's just because when people mix vo specifically advertising agencies and post houses 
They want to be able to turn down the drums a little bit. You or, mean voiceover. Oh, VO. yeah. VO, yeah. They want to turn down the drums a little bit. They want to turn up the guitar during the chorus part to, you know, enhance the action on screen, whatever that is. So if bands have access to the stems from their tracks, they're more licensable because creatives want that. So how much of your day do you spend listening to new music? Oh, new music? Not I mean, I listen to any of the artists in our roster, so it's as fast as we're getting new music in. That's when I'm listening to new music. So um, that's that's what I mean. So what you listen to during the day is what you're being sent yeah, exactly. to listen to. So I'm listening to music probably half my day because I'm doing searches. I'm either listening to the reference tracks that my clients send me that they're hoping to match or find something similar to, or I'm listening to the music that I'm sending them. And then the other half of my day is quoting or talking to artists. How many people in your company would you say are like weird encyclopedic walking <laughs> knowledge banks of yeah. like very obscure songs? <laughs> there are a lot of them. We have each person in my company tends to have that one genre and niche that they're just super obsessed with and they know way too much about. And if you get them talking on it, they will never stop. About half the people at Marmoset are musicians, possibly on the roster. And then the other half are just music nerds. And they are those kind of people that... Like, right. tell me about Appalachian rock from the 1970s. They're like, just tell you everything they know about it. And you're like, I didn't even know that was a genre until right now. I just made that up. <laughs> yeah. but you knew about it. Yeah, actually, this makes me happy because it makes me realize that there's like a place for old music nerds to go now. Like we've created in the industry our own place mm-hmm. for like these people to have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. if you don't work in a record store and you're not, you know, because record stores have changed now and yeah. customers don't want to be told. The ins and outs necessarily of this oh, the, the third <laughs> album by the drummer's cousin that right. you really <laughs> should have heard. Then obviously licensing is where to where to end up. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think so. It, it tends to be where all the music nerds gravitate towards eventually. Because yeah, you can talk about music all day long with people who actually want to hear you talk about it. Right, exactly. Which is very different from like your friends and family. Right. So, <laughs> no doubt. So Richie, what's coming up for you next? Are you working on anything right now? for licensing or are you working on a new record or what are you doing? We released Pens from Spain in September of 2016 and we're just working on a new EP and some seven inches now. It's kind of going back and forth as a musician, like writing, recording, and then you by that time you burn out and then you tour and then you, you burn out <laughs> of touring. So you're really excited to write again. So I'm in that. that yeah, that's the cycle. My, my, my touring battery is at 2%, but my like writing, I'm really excited to write music. But yeah, just work on future music as long as I can. So... When you do seven inches, when you, do you do those to have something to sell on tour? We've tried to to just do seven inches with bands that'll actually sell them. <laughs> like we just take the tiny little percentage to tour with. But like we were lucky enough to do a split seven inch recently with Ty Seagull. And I think he, it was just, it was a tour seven inch and he sold like 1900 in a week. Whoa. Just wow. touring. And then we got the extra 110 or something, you know, <laughs> and we're still selling them. So... That's what we're trying to do. I mean, it's fun. To, uh, seven inches are my favorite because they're short, but they're they're very expensive and they're very hard to get rid of. So, well, that's I was, that's what I was thinking because I back in my day when I was in bands, you know, twenty years ago or whatever, we used to do split seven inches all the time, yeah. and it was fun because you could sort of pair up with another band and then have something to sell at shows. But seven inches have like kind of gone the way of the dodo in this weird way. Like people don't really want them like they want vinyl. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, but they're fun. I just I they don't are know. They're fun. It's true. I, I just, they're fun to hold and they're cheap and they're <laughs> cool. They're, it's, I'm in love with seven inches and I, and I think forever I'll be in love with seven inches. But thank, you know, thankfully, like vinyl is popular, really popular again. So you can kind of just like $2 extra and you have a seven inch too, you know. Right. It's, worst comes to worst, you can always package it with your LP. Yeah. Just jam it in there. <laughs> just stuck <laughs> seven in there. So do you guys have any advice for young bands, Kat, probably for you just coming from like what you're going to receive from them? Like what should they think about before they send stuff to you? And Richie, you know, stuff that you could have done differently or that you think you did right in approaching licensing your music. I do think having instrumentals and open sessions of your track is the most important thing to have because a lot of people lose those after the recording session is over. I also think knowing that your vocal version of your track probably won't get licensed as much as your instrumental is important because a lot of people, they want that full track to be what's licensed. And a lot of movies, ads, they they have voiceover or dialogue that they want over the spot. So to set your expectations to know that your lead singer's voice might not appear on the spot when it's done. 
Yeah, we've definitely learned our lesson. We have a song called Elephants and Little Girls, and Jared Meese from Tender Love and Empire years ago called me, and he was like, please tell me you have Elephants and Little Girls without the vocals. And a band made of ours, his hard drive crashed, and so we didn't have that. <laughs> and he's like, please, 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 they want it. It's It's kind of a go. And we didn't have it. And then they moved on. So <sighs> it was like... That is a story I hear from so many people. I know. It's, yeah, the, so, my hard drive crashed. It was on my old computer. And you're like, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> and things move so fast that you should... I think now we're we're completely prepared to move in within minutes. But like, you know, you don't think about that stuff. Yeah, this is the boring aspect. Like, I feel like a lot of what I do on this podcast, you know, talking to bands about the music business seems really boring to them. But ultimately, it can really make a huge difference in the long run. Like... Just the notion of storage. Like, how are you going to, you, you you bothered yeah. to make a fabulous album. If you make instrumentals of it, you make stems of it, you make the non, you know, whatever. How are you going to store that? Like, where where are you going to keep that in a really safe location so that, you know, nobody's hard drive crashes and there there goes your, you know, $10,000 yeah. worth do you of. store your stuff at Marmoset? We have a giant server oh. <laughs> that we store everything on internally. A lot of bands I know use, like, we transfer in Dropbox to send it to us, but I think most bands use external hard drives, which is scary to think about. They get wet and crash. And, yeah. <laughs> and also think about making multiple copies because, yeah. you know, technology changes. And, you know, we just okay. recently got asked for a Decemberist song, for instrumentals of a Decemberist song from way back. And we went and looked and we had it on DAT. <laughs> we're oh, like, wow. uh, can anybody listen to this? <laughs> Does anyone have any equipment? We were like, oh, man. So, yeah, be careful what you store things on. Yeah. So how fast should artists be prepared to turn things around? So I have a three-hour turnaround on all my inquiries, and that's just something I try to do because that's how fast they're moving in the industry. But for bands, if they can get me something next day that is super beneficial, a lot of our bands tour. So I have to say to the client, you know, they're in Spain right now. They have to go to an internet cafe to send this to you. We'll get it, you know, in three days. As long as you can set expectations, but the faster you can do it, the better. So does that mean that you like to store some stuff yourselves? Like, would you prefer to have stuff at Marmoset so that oh, way yeah. you can, yeah, you don't the, have to be asking the band for it? Totally. So the bands I have stems in-house, that is great because mm. I the band has already given me permission that if someone asks for it, I can send it along. And when the client asks me, it takes me five minutes to transfer it to them and they already have it for their session. So they're not telling their editor, you know, come back in on Thursday because that's when the band will deliver and it's just right there. Oh, and another aspect we haven't talked to you about this about clearing. Oh, you have to also know who has your publishing. Like, if you own your own publishing, you need to know that. And then you need, you know, Marmoset or whoever is licensing your music needs to know that. Right, and what percentage? Everything and what percentage, <laughs> so that you can make sure that you're properly getting paid. Do you guys have all that stuff organized? Yeah, I'm unorganized, so my smart band members are organized and it's all taken <laughs> oh, nice. care of. So I just lean on them for That's that stuff. So. Fabulous. That's it. Big plus. On that line, too, it's really great to know your performing oh, rights yeah. organizations because we have clients that you're going to broadcast that next day and they want your information immediately so that they can send it to the station. And a lot of our bands are like, oh, we don't know. We're not sure who we're registered with. And to have that information on hand is super, super helpful. Yep. 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 ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Mm -hmm. It's pretty straightforward, guys. So when you sign a new band or when you tell a band that you want to work with them, do you ask for all that stuff in advance? Yes. So we always tell our artists, please, please register and copyright your music and get it registered with a PRO, production rights organization, and give us all that information so we have it on file. Because our bands are DIY, that can be a slow process and not all of them do it. It's something that we highly, highly recommend. But again, we'll still work with them if they don't have it. It's just more beneficial for them to have it. Right, because the turnaround times can be very, very fast. Yeah. And if you aren't registered with a PRO and you get licensed for a giant broadcast spot, then you're not collecting royalties and it just helps to do it in advance. Absolutely. Wise advice. Awesome. Well, Kat Olson and Richie Young, thank you guys so much for being with me today on The Future of What. Thank you, Borsha. Yeah, thank you. Want to hear more on this topic? Vortex Music Magazine is hosting a free all-ages panel on music licensing with these guests and more on April 30th at the Doug Fur Lounge in Portland. Find more info at vrtxmag.com.
That was Column of Streetlight by Milagres. And that's our show. The music we played today was used by permission. You heard Summer Cannibals, Wimps, Milagres, and of course our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by The Delta Five. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a review. For more info on our shows, check out our website at killrockstars.com slash future of what. Our program was engineered by Brent Asbury at Beta Petrol and is produced by Will Watts and Anna McLean. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rock Stars. See you next week. Can I have a taste of your ice cream? This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network.